People who know that I'm a decision theorist often ask me, okay, here I have a problem for you, help me make a decision. And I feel that often there is some kind of unrealistic expectation of what the, the field can do for people. And take some time to explain, look, I'm a decision theorist, it doesn't mean that I know what the correct decision is. And uh, I think it is important to understand how we can use these models of decision making. Um, I think there are two extremes, maybe there's a whole spectrum uh, between them. Uh, there are classes of problems in which indeed you could write down the problem in a mathematical way, apply a mathematical algorithm, find the right solution, that's it. An example, you want to get in a city from point A to point B, you tell me whether it's point A and point B, you tell me what are your criteria, the shortest path, the prettiest, whatever, suppose you say the shortest. I put it on an algorithm, Google Maps or whatever, and I calculate the fastest route. We have algorithms for this for decades, and that's the simplest way to do it. And I find the shortest argument and say, oh, it doesn't feel right, my intuition was to go this way. I say, come on, intuition, with all due respect, here is the algorithm, we formulated your problem, we know what you want, that's the correct answer. Next, suppose that you come to me and say, um, I have this amount of money I want to invest, what should I do? You're a decision theorist, tell me, well, how should I invest it? And here my answer is, I don't know. Um, there are many possible scenarios out there, I don't know where to get the probabilities from the, for these. Um, it's a matter of intuition. I would guess that if you have a lot of money, your intuition is probably better than mine, because how come you ended up with so much money? Probably you know how to invest, okay? So who am I to tell you? And yet, uh, I think that the decision theorists can help you in trying to take your decision in this extreme, even after you made it, you have your own intuition as to what's the correct decision. And I'm asking you, okay, let's try to think what did you put into it? For instance, we adopt this model of expected utility maximization. Okay, we can have a debate of whether this is the right model or not, but let's, for the sake of the argument, agree that this is the model you want to work with. And then I say, let's try to think, what is your utility function? And what are your probabilities that justify this kind of a decision? So maybe, you know, we'll think about something else. You choose a career and uh, you tell me, I like it and say, let's try to think, what about it do you like? And it turns out that you like a lifestyle. Or maybe you like the social aspect because you think it's very respectable and all your friends are going to envy you. That's fine. That could be part of your utility function. But talking to me might make you, make you face it and you have to say, do I want to put so much weight on the way I'm viewed by my friends or not? If so, perfectly so. Yes, but just putting it down in a formal model might make you contrast these kind of um, beliefs, uh, I'm sorry, decisions in, in taste in this case, but also beliefs. In the case of beliefs, suppose that you are taking your money out of one investment, putting it in another or something, and I'm trying to say what it is that you have in mind. What, is, what are the scenarios you think about? You'll have to write down the scenarios, you'll have to see what kind of probabilities would make sense, would justify this decision. Again, it's your own beliefs, okay? But the model can help you see whether it makes sense, whether you want to, this is the kind of decisions you want to make or not. Okay? In between there are many situations of dialogues. Now the reason I'm mentioning this is that often people have a feeling that either you go all the way with a mathematical model or you ignore it completely. Either you just go with your intuition or you relegate it all to a computer. And the truth I think is that most decision situations are in between. So in the mathematical model, you can say, okay, you have these very math sophisticated mathematical models of you know, the stock market and I'm using all these sophisticated integrals that many people can't understand. They'll just buy it like this because they can't understand. So they think it's, it comes out of the computer, it must be correct. Um, and then people are somewhat sometimes disappointed, uh, be it because of, of a crash like in 2007-8 or for other reasons they say I don't like it, I don't like the decision that I, that I ended up making or something like that. On the other extreme people say oh all this is rubbish and I just have my intuition. These are possible extremes but again I think typically we need a dialogue. We need a dialogue where someone says okay this is what I know, this is what I don't know, this is what I, I feel strongly about, this is where I'm hesitating. Let's try to sort through my intuitions. Let's try to put them in a more formal language. It's not that the model would give me the correct answer, but it would be a sort of a prop, a sort of a way to check my own logic. Now, uh, this relates to the uh, 
two other issues. One is the notion of rationality, um, and the other one is the way that we use models in economics at large. So let me start with rationality. So we have this definition of rationality as robustness, basically. So you make a certain decision, and it's rational for you if when I confront you to, with the analysis of that, you're not, you don't feel bad about it. You, you like the decision, you keep it this way. Um, but we can try to refine it and distinguish between two notions of rationality. One, which we call the objective rationality, would mean something that practically every reasonable person would accept. Okay, so today, if I tell you, look, um, smoking is bad for you. Smoking damages your health. You could still try to avoid this, but we have a lot of data today that would say that's probably the case. On the other hand, if we talk about you know, the risk of uh, cellular phones, uh, I don't think that the scientific data is so clear out there. Uh, global warming might be in between. People still debate or whether we have evidence that, of what's going on and the effect of human interaction, global warming. So th there could be things where I don't have necessarily a way to convince you. Science has many open problems that, for various reasons, we cannot resolve. And then, you could, as a decision maker, you could do whatever you like. However, you are subjectively rational if you feel okay with your own decision. So, objectively rational is something that I can say, I can convince any reasonable person that that's the right thing to do. Subjectively rational only means I cannot convince you that this is the wrong thing to do. Okay? So, it's not necessarily the choice that everyone else would make, but it's something that you could defend as, as a decision maker who's sort of what you call reasonable, of course, has to be defined. Eventually, it's going to depend on many empirical notions of which society we're talking about, what do we mean by convince, all these uh, things that would need to be clear, clear, clarified if we really want to apply this. But the notion is that there are more one, than one type of rationality. Okay? One is, sort of, so to speak, on the offense, the other one is on the defense. Um, the other thing I would like to relate it to is uh, what good are models in economics in general. Um, <clears throat> economics is considered to be a very successful science, not only by economists. I mean, some other people also think it's a successful so social science. It's definitely the most mathematically sophisticated social science. Um, economists are doing well in many ways. Uh, students like to study economics and so on. But people confront this success with the fact that economists don't seem to predict things like you know, financial crisis, and economists are using all the wrong assumptions, as every assumption that is used in economics has been proven wrong by psychologists like you know, Kahneman, Tversky, and their followers. Uh, and there are many reasons for critique, and some of it are also critiques which are more postmodern in line that say it's not just that it's a wrong theory, but it's actually the wrong theory for the wrong reasons, namely that people who promote uh, certain lines of economic theory do it for their own interest. And you see, for instance, the people who support free markets also happen to be on boards of firms and, and make a lot of money and so on, so it's not. It's not even, they don't even attempt to be objective. I mean, there's some interest behind it. Now, I should say that all three uh, types of critiques are relevant and, and valid and important, and economists should heed these kind of, of warnings. Uh, but we also have to take them in, in, in proportion. So, um, on the last one, I don't have much to say about the fact that when we're dealing with science, we have our own subjective interests in the back of our minds. That's probably always true. The only thing we can do is try to avoid them. I mean, it's not... Um, there's, it's a very important insight going back to Foucault, if not much earlier, that whatever you do in a social context might be an act that serves certain, certain power groups. Um, all I can say is that we should try to cope with that. I mean, just like we cannot be perfectly objective, it doesn't mean it shouldn't, be, shouldn't try. Um, similar to the fact that I can tell you I don't believe that we'll ever have eternal peace, but it doesn't mean that we should start shooting each other. Okay, we'll never have eternal peace, at least let's try. But I'm afraid I don't have much more to say about that. On the critique of financial crisis, uh, one thing should be fair to the profession and to say that Financial crises are a very complex kind of phenomena. 
And we know from various theories, including chaos theory in physics, that when you have a very complex system, you might not be able to predict what's going on later on. The butterfly effect and these kind of, of phenomena are there. So if you think about physics, which is a very successful science that has found out all the basic flow equations and everything, and still has problems predicting when applied, has problems predicting um, earthquakes and hurricanes and things like that, who are we to even try to predict financial crisis? Okay. We have two problems as compared to physics. One is that we don't have the basic flow equations. Okay, so we don't have the basic science that established and works at least in the lab. Not, we're not there. And the other one is that we're dealing with a system that reacts to our own, to the, our theories. Okay, so the description of the theory, of the system can change it. If you predict a hurricane in two days, it's not going to come one day earlier. But if you predict a financial crisis in two days, it will come one day earlier. So um, um, we, we have to be, I think, fair to the economics profession and say this is probably not what we are after. Okay? There are many other things that we can do. We are doing much better in situations that can be isolated in laboratory experiments, not like the entire financial world or the entire globe, uh, but something that can be isolated and can be experimented with, then economics does indeed do better. The other important thing is that with uh, assumptions that are false. And the question is, how can you learn anything from assumptions that are false? And actually, economists have been bothered by this since Milton Friedman in the 1950s. Uh, and there's a lot of discussions of these things. I will not try to summarize everything. I'll just try to suggest two ways to look at it. It might be a little bit new. One is that uh, part of the reasoning that we do in economics is not by rules, but by cases, not by general theories, but by analogies. Now, reasoning by analogies is something that we see in psychology. It's, it exists everywhere. In statistics, we have similar techniques. I mean, I will not get into details, but often what's called non-parametric statistics statistic is closer to reasoning by analogies than to reasoning by general rules. And there's no reason that in the philosophy of science we would not have the two types of reasoning. So the classical Popperian view of science is to find general th theories or general rules, and then you have a counterexample, you have to go back and rework it and refine it. But if you think now of a certain model not as a general statement, not a universal quantifier there for every blah, 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 there will be, etc., but rather you say this is sort of an example, a theoretical thing, theoretical case, I would call it, but something that helps you think about situations in the world. And next time you see a situation, you ask yourself, oh, is it similar to that or to this? And then when you think about a model and a, an example of a refutation thereof, suddenly there is no conflict because you see the theoretical model which says one thing and you see the experiment that was run in the lab that says something else. Now, the event you're interested in, you ask yourself, is it more similar to this or to that? Because cases do not contradict each other because they do not contain any universal quantifier that says for every. Okay? And I think this captures much of the way that uh, many economists feel, economic theories or applied game theories feel that our models provide a lot of insight and do a lot of good, and yet they seem to be very simplified and the assumptions are never correct. And people ask us, how could you learn something from a model that's not true, from a false model? And I think part of the answer is that sometimes we think in a way that is more case-based and rule-based, in a way that's more analogical than general theories. The other uh, point to, the other way to look at economic models is to say, let's pretend for a second that economics is not only about prediction. We're not trying to make predictions. Our job is to critique. We're standing there and we hear arguments in the public domain, um, a politician says something, a journalist says something else, and you come and say, wait a minute, there's a problem in this argument. Okay. And suppose that this is our role. Our role is just to be there in the public sphere and to say, for instance, you look over the shoulder of someone and say, there's a mistake in your proof. I'm not saying what should be written there, but this argument doesn't work. Or what you're describing is not an equilibrium. So it's a nice story, but people would react and therefore something would happen and so on. Or even what you're describing doesn't match the data. It's a nice idea, but you see the data so show something else. Okay? 
An example could be, of this could be the Leffler curve in the 1970s, where Leffler convinced the um, Ford administration that increasing the tax rate doesn't necessarily result in higher income uh, from, tax, from taxation or higher revenue from taxation. Um, so he drew on a piece of paper, on a napkin, he drew this curve that got his, his name on it that says, you know, if you start at zero uh, rate, then of course you get zero taxes. If you put 100%, then no one would bother to work and then you also get zero taxes. And in between you have this kind of curve. A uh, very simplified model, just uh, kind of a toy thing. All it was really doing is testing a certain line of reasoning that says we need more money, let's raise taxes in the hope of getting higher revenue. Okay. Does it say what was the right thing to do? No. Economists even today think that maybe it was wrong. Maybe they were on this part of the curve where increasing the tax rate could have increased revenue. But the contribution was still just to show that there is a flaw in an existing argument. Now, if you compare economists to historians, you say, look, historians are, everyone knows that we need them, we love them, uh, but no one would ask a historian for predictions. Serious historians would not tell you what's going to happen. They say, look, I studied the past. I'm not, I'm not a fortune teller. Um, if you compare economics to that, you say, maybe what the good that we do for society is just to test coherence of arguments to test the uh, reasoning. And that's another way in which economics can be useful. Now, if you take that point of view, and I'm not saying it's the only one, I'm not saying it's the only contribution of economics, but if you take that, you could suddenly see how a simple model that's obviously false can still convey a very important point and explain to people why a certain line of reasoning that they thought was very cogent is actually not. Um, so I think that these are two uh, ways to look at why economic models can be useful even if the assumptions they make are, are false. And it, it helps us to think about what we can expect of models in economics, similar to the idea of what we expect of the models in decision theory that sometimes are only to test the logic of a decision that you already made, uh, not with the help of the model.